out the aerobic capacity and what that is all about because um, there's a lot of confusion, um, a lot of basic principles that people are aware of, but they don't know what they're actually doing when they do it. So let's say something like um, a base phase. So when you're building base, everyone's like, yeah, you just got to go long and slow and that's what we've got to do and people do that. But we're going to talk about the adaptation that happens and then how you progress that adaptation to benefit you. Um, particularly, we're talking to age groupers who are training for long distance triathlons. So anything, um, a half Ironman up to an Ironman or even ultras, longer events like that, because that's where aerobic capacity, fat adaptation really come into the, its own where it's really important that we minimize the stress by using more oxygen and more fat for fuel um, and keep the stress levels low so that we're feeling strong towards the end of the race still. So um, Jamie's distracting me there by playing myself in the background, um, but she's telling me it's working, so that's good. Um, so what we need to be thinking about is What's happening with something like that base building phase? Um, I'm just going to look at some notes here. The base building phase is that aerobic adaptation. And what's happening when we do math? So everybody, a lot of people are aware of math principles, maximum aerobic function developed by Dr. Phil Maffetone back in the late 70s. And he realized and trained Mark Allen using this method that if you build up your aerobic capacity, then your ability to perform over endurance events increases greatly. And the reasons that I'm going to go through here that they increase, how that performance increases is through, um, let me get rid of these because I can't hear myself anyway. Um, so what's happening? So aerobic means we're using a lot of oxygen and technically pretty much everything that we do other than about like a seven second sprint is aerobic because we are using oxygen. It's just this ratio of are we using more oxygen or are we using less oxygen? Less oxygen, you know, you're using other pathways such as glucose uh, dominant pathways and less oxygen so we know that things like lactate are produced as that ratio changes so as we use less oxygen um oh good we got a mate from ireland um another one that can see and hear me thanks guys for letting me know um <clears throat> so that's one thing that's happening we are building these capillaries we are building the ability of our mitochondria to be more aerobic. So the capillaries are increasing in number and, and volume to take more oxygen out of the blood and then the oxygen from the blood into the muscles, the muscles, and then into the next lower level down, right down into the mitochondria. So then in the mitochondria, if there's more oxygen in there, they can use more fat for fuel. So this is a two-part answer where fat burning and oxygen usage go hand in hand. So staying at that lower level and building a base phase, we're increasing oxygen carrying capillaries, which you can do through VO2 max efforts and that sort of thing as well, which is why they are good and have their place and, and people get results. And they're not something to never do. Um, but then when it comes to the fat burning aspect of this, though, the other side of the, the coin, what needs to be done is um, optimize the mitochondria where the energy are made uh, for burning fat. So to do that, we need to stay in a very aerobic state. Um, so basically, we need to be using a lot of oxygen, not using the anaerobic system as much. So we're always still using um, oxygen. It's always aerobic, but the air anaerobic system as much. Um, by using more glucose if we're going harder, which is why in that base phase, you want to use, uh, keep to your heart rate that you know is staying aerobic, which is around your maximum aerobic function. 
Um, so that's math. 180 minus your age is your base starting point heart rate number for you to then decide um, if that is a good point for you. And Phil's just put out an ebook um, yesterday, which I recommend you go and check out. And he's written plenty of things about 180 minus your age as a starting point, but that's what it is. It's a starting point. He's written about how there are variables. If you've been sick and injured, um, then you probably need to take a few beats off that. If you're um, if you have aerobic deficiency syndrome, which is a phrase that Phil coined a long time ago as well, um, where basically you have done so much anaerobic work. Well, let's say you've done so much work using glucose in a low oxygen state that you have trained your muscles, detrained your muscles to using fat for fuel. So therefore, if they're using more glucose, there's more byproduct, there's more stress, you can't go as long as efficiently. So there's so many layers to this that it's easy for me to kind of like get off track and, and, and lose my spot. But <clears throat> base building phase, if you're, let's say you're eating a lot of high carbohydrate foods and sugars the whole time during that aerobic heart rate phase, then you're going to be influencing what the mitochondria are using for energy. So you might be doing long and slow, but basically if you're still using a lot of glucose for the fuel in your mitochondria in that period, you're not actually going to get the adaptation that you are trying to get. You would be better off doing more VO2 max efforts if you wanna keep eating sugars and having a high blood sugar all the time because having a high blood sugar, you're forcing those glucose in into the muscles um, and they are gonna burn it through those mitochondria. And you're going to um, not be training your mitochondria to burn fat. So therefore you're not training your muscles to burn fat. Um, so you're not really building up a lot of um, and those you'll still build up some good capillaries and, and some um, increased oxygen carrying capacity. Um, certainly, you're not going to get unfit. But in terms of the aerobic capacity, which has to be a two-part system, a two-part of burning more fat for fuel and um, using more oxygen in that fuel mixture. So... Very briefly, energy is not just fuel-based. And it's basically, you can't think of energy as fuel-based at all. So what I'm saying is that whether you put fat in your body, whether you put sugar in your body, it doesn't matter. That doesn't give you more energy. Energy is produced from all these other complex systems in our body that revolve around our health of our cells, of our mitochondria. So, you know, obviously we know that things like sunlight have a huge impact. The nitric oxide, the vitamin D, they are part of this energy uh, puzzle. Um, other things like our perception of energy. So caffeine is a part of this energy puzzle. But well, let's say it's not caffeine, but our perception is one of the biggest parts of this energy puzzle. Um, and energy only exists on demand. So you can't produce more energy. You can feel like you have more energy, but that's exactly it. It is a feeling, therefore it is a perception of having more energy. And it therefore, you know, it's your perception that then means you will move faster, do more, and that is what then creates more energy. So you can't eat more and have more energy. It's all just the perception of energy. So back to what's going on with... Um, using fat for fuel. Obviously, you're never going to run out of fat for fuel. So you can go, you know, days and days and days and your energy levels will not actually get low in terms of a fuel availability. So your energy levels will get low because of other hormonal reactions and um, the oxidative stress that builds up in your muscles and a few other things like that. And I'll try to get to what's going on there a bit later with oxidative stress and how that slows you down. Um, but back to math, 180 minus your age. So let's say you do this for six months. 
And a lot of people then say, okay, I've hit this for six months and um, my, my math pace has improved. So 180 minus my age, I've stayed at that heart rate and my pace has improved, but now I'm plateauing. And, and that's fantastic. It's great. It, you've, you've gotten your body healthy. If you've been eating a low carb diet, you've also optimized your fat burning ability, um, which can take six months to 18 months. Like if you were really, really low carb, um, you know, like, like myself basically, um, and I know there's a lot of other people out there as well, your ability uh, to use other pathways for fuel, not just fat and glucose, but there's all these other pathways for recycling the byproducts, um, creating energy out of less, out of ketones, um, out of lactate, and all of these other byproducts that, that get produced, you get better and better and better at using these for energy. So there's many, many fuel sources in our body. And you get better and better at them over time. But let's say you've done everything right. You've eaten a low-carb diet and you've trained just aerobically for six months. Um, but for the last two months, you've, your, your pace has plateaued. Um, let's say it's on the run. And let's assume it's not related to technique because often that is a really big factor of um, plateau technique. Uh, let's say it's not related to technique. Let's say it's not related to your perception of your own ability. Let's say it's not related to an underlying health issue. Uh, let's say you are perfect health. Your mitochondria can produce energy perfectly. You feel great all day, every day. Um, everything's going good. Let's, so it is only related to you've hit this level where you can't actually go faster at that heart rate. And normally, let's say that would be quite a good heart, a pace. Let's say that you're running so fast at your math heart rate that it's actually difficult for you to hold that for an extended period of time. So what's happened at that point is that your, your math, your maximum aerobic function is no longer 180 minus your age because that is just an equation for a start, a base number of um, what's going on. So what we want to do is actually increase the math number that you would be targeting because your maximum aerobic function has increased. Your ability to still be burning fat and still be getting a lot of oxygen into your cells in your muscles at a higher intensity has increased. You've built up enough capillaries. You've increased the number of mitochondria. You've, got in, you've increased the ability to produce energy from less. You have gotten stronger. You've gotten fitter. So your ability to breathe has increased. You're wasting less energy by just purely breathing in itself. Um, so all of these things have improved. So you need to then set a math pace, which is, is potentially higher than that. And it's not to say, well, now you'll go out and run at a even faster pace that you can't hold for an extended period. What it would be is that you would not need to be scared of going over your math heart rate, your 180 minus your age base starting point heart rate. You don't need to be scared of going over it. Um, and I've got clients that are, you know, basically eating a, an almost zero carb diet and they feel the best they've felt in their whole life. And they're 50 years old. A couple of them are 50 years old, aches and pains, weight loss, all of these things improved um, when they basically did go zero carb and really cleaned up their diet. And now they're getting to the point where their, their results in training are just, they, they're really getting great results in training since adopting a really low carb diet, which basically it, it got them healthier. So I'm not going to say it was the zero carbs that helped. It was more the change in what they were eating per se 
that helped them reduce inflammation, which then improved their ability to produce energy to, to, for their muscles to adapt and to recover. So I'm now starting to get them just to nudge that, that math uh, perception, that, that number in their mind that they've got about this is my limit that I can go to. I now have to say, oh no, it's okay to go a bit above that. You're going to still be, you're going to still be using a lot of oxygen. You're still be going to use using predominantly fat for fuel. You're not going to be producing so much uh, oxidative stress that you know recovery is an issue. And that's one factor that you can look at when you want to see where my math is at. Um, that the how is your recovery? So as you go harder, as you think, if you think that, oh, I want to test if, if my math heart rate is actually above this. And for a lot of people, they want to test it on the run generally because if you've got an aerobic deficiency, then your running pace is almost basically a walking pace at your 180 minus your age starting point for a lot of people. And that is because you're aerobically deficient. And we've just had one client come across to us who all her training has been done with a heart rate of about 170. Um, And she is, I think, close to 40 years old. So let's just say that. And her heart, her math, starting her aerobic capacity should be around 140. She should be able to do like a comfortable effort uh, of pace at a 140 heart rate. But no, like basically out the door, a minute into a jog, and her heart rate's already past a 140. And so she has to basically, she has to be walking to keep her heart rate below that. So she's got a huge aerobic deficiency syndrome where because so much of her training was done in this heightened state. So not just a high heart rate state, but a heightened state of sympathetic nervous system. So all of those other responses, hormonal, blood pressure, cortisol, Um, and everything else that has been pumping glucose through her body, even when she's not ingesting it, she would have been stressing her body so much that she would have been purely using glycogen in her muscles. She would have been releasing glycogen as glucose out of her liver. So, you know, you don't have to be eating glucose to still be using glucose. So, If you're doing hard efforts, but think, oh, I haven't eaten anything. I've been fasting for, you know, 20 hours and now I'm going to go do this intense workout. I must be fat burning. Well, no, you're not because your liver and muscles have stored enough glycogen for hours and hours of exercise. And if you go out and just do 40 minutes of really hard exercise, you are just going to be using the the glycogen in your muscles And then if you stress yourself in terms of your sympathetic nervous system, if you get your heart rate and and response up that high that it is going to increase your cortisol, then you're going to release, the glycogen is going to release as glucose into your bloodstream straight out of your liver. So a hard effort, you'll use the glycogen stored in those muscles, the ones that you are using, but the liver will pump it into your bloodstream and it will go everywhere. So just think about that. It's quite an interesting fact that the glycogen is stored glucose and glucose is what is available in your bloodstream or when it's used as um, broken down to be used as energy in the mitochondria. So you've got stored glycogen and then you've got the, the glucose as it's moving. So same thing, but they're just in different forms. Um, so... Let's just say so that so you even if you fasted, you can still be training your body to be using more glucose than you want it to be. So the oxidative stress part that I mentioned earlier, um, when you train with less oxygen available, so when you train harder and you are using more glucose for energy, that Obviously, you know, it sounds there's less oxygen available, more glucose being used. We know that that is more towards producing lactate. Now, it's not just producing lactate. Lactate isn't necessarily a bad thing. Lactate isn't the thing that 
um, actually gives you the burn. It's just happening at the same time. Lactate can actually then be reused as an energy fuel itself. Um, it's just become that phrase of, well, that lactic burn because yes, lactic is rising at the same time as that feeling is rising. Um, but people train themselves can train themselves to not feel the burn as their lactic levels increase. So that's obvious then it is not the lactate that is causing the burning. Um, anyway, so there's lots of different byproducts that happen when you're using less oxygen and more glucose. So one of those things is the main thing is oxidative stress. So there's a, there's a few different pathways that oxygen comes in, in, makes energy little molecules and things change as it comes in and rolls through the mitochondria. The byproducts of using the glycogen for fuel create more free radicals, more oxidative stress. So that is why if that is why we the most obvious example is that you would want to negative split a running race. You very rarely see and nobody really plans on going out and running the first at the Olympics. You don't see it happen where they'll run the first, you know, two and a half thousand meters of the 5K flat out. They're, they're not going to do it because what happens is the accumulative stress of going more into a less lower oxygen burning, more glucose burning state produces more oxidative stress that is there. You can't get rid of it. So it stays there. So it stays in your cells and then it will inhibit the production of energy after that. So the ATP is inhibited, the production of ATP. So, and that's related to cramping. And I might try and come back to that. But so let's um, back to where I was, the guy running, drawing the negative split on the 5K track. That is a perfect example and simple explanation of why we um, don't want to go too hard when we're planning on training our body to adapt to being aerobic and fat burning. We want to train it to use more oxygen and we want to train it to use fat for fuel. So if you go out at the start of your ride as I've got one client that did this and, and he's even much older than 50, uh, he's in his 60s and not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, he had a little bit of a virus and I mean, his, his CRP went up to 70 because he felt so crap, he went and got his bloods checked and his C-reactive protein was up to 70, which is a, a marker of inflammation. 70 is very, very high. Uh, he went and checked four days later, it was 12. So he was improving, but 12 still quite high. Um, the next thing when he then went and did a training session, this is like moved on a couple of weeks later and we'd been talking about, okay, you really can't like push yourself, you know, the oxidative stress, you're older. We can see that your CRPs are going up every time you train. We don't want to keep pushing that. Um, but he went out with a group ride and pushed a bit hard at the start and looking at his heart rate graph. I mean, the ride wasn't that hard, but he really spiked his heart rate in the first 35 minutes. At the 35 minute mark of a two hour ride, it really spiked. And so what happened there, as I explained to him, was that by increasing the oxidative stress and free radicals early on in that training session, for the rest of that session, his ability to be aerobic and produce ATP and to produce energy um, was was uh, inhibited. So his ability to stay aerobic was inhibited. Um, and for somebody who's older and uh, their recovery rates aren't as quick, you know, he because he spiked it there at 35 minutes and then rode another hour. 25 um, at a more moderate heart rate, but still with a few spikes, but not as much as that first spike. Totally different story and recovery than if he'd gone out and slowly built that site, that ride and he'd stayed aerobic and it slowly climbed and then they hit that high heart rate in the last five minutes and then a cool down. So yes, he still would have had oxidative stress from that 
hard effort at the end. But for the first hour 55, he would have been training his body in a low stress state without that accumulative load. So it's a bit like a, a compounding interest uh, in a loan. You know, so if you start off with a bit and then a bit and a bit, and it, it grows exponentially. So if you stress your body out at the start and put all that stress into the cells and then ask it to produce energy despite this big clump of stress and free radicals and oxidative stress there in its way, it can't. It is going to have to create more stress on top of that stress to do the same workload and produce the same amount of energy that in a fresh rested state without that stress, it would have been doing. I mean, you don't go into a race having done a hard effort the morning of the race. Why? Because you're not going to perform as well. Why? Because there's oxidative stress in the muscles and you cannot perform as well because the energy can't be produced as easily with that stress already there in the muscles. So there are all these examples throughout history of how stress works and how we need to pick when we want to add stress and be very smart about what the adaptation uh, that we want out of the certain session is. So we have to make sure that we've got a goal for the session. We have to make sure um, that we stick to that goal and... Um, and I mean, not just for performance, being aerobically and fat adapted is beautiful for long distance exercise, um, but obviously for health in general. If you are more aerobically adapted, that means there's more oxygen carrying through your body. That means there's more oxygen getting through to the far reaches of your hands, your feet, everything like that. I mean, an example that we can all see is what happens to diabetics. So the, they are so unable to burn fat for fuel. They have become, they have an inability now to burn fat if they're type 2 diabetic that they um, aren't carrying oxygen through their blood. And that is why, you know, they often need to be, have limbs amputated. Um, some one of the major factors of poor health in type 2 diabetics is this lack of oxygen um, getting through their body, this lack of blood flow. So there are huge benefits to being aerobically fit and adapted to burning fat for fuel. You don't get low blood sugar for one. You don't even notice it. Um, once you kind of have got past that point and you are slightly uh, able to produce ketones and burn fat, you don't even notice a low blood sugar. So coming back to what I mentioned at the start, maybe a few people thought, hang on, but if I have a gel during a race when I'm starting to bonk, I do feel better. So how can sugar not be energy? Um, well, quite simply that you only notice that you had low blood sugar because you aren't fat adapted, you didn't have ketones, so your brain actually freaked out and went, Blood sugar is the only fuel source I've ever been aware of since I was like one year old. Since you started eating carbohydrates, you haven't been aware of ketones since. You have them when you were born. You've forgotten a long, about that a long time ago. So once you become fat adapted and you're producing ketones, your body recognizes that there's this other fuel source that is available to it and you, and it does not need to freak out if your blood sugar drops. So the only reason that your brain freaks out is because your blood sugar drops a little bit, which someone like me and all the other people that are keto adapted don't even notice if yours, if you've, you know, you've got this, uh, you're bonking and you feel like crap, your blood sugar, if it's the same as my blood sugar, I would not even notice there would be a difference in, in me while you would feel absolutely terrible with the same blood sugar. So... You feel better because then when you have the gel, your brain's blood sugar goes back up. It's one source of energy that it recognizes for you, increases, and it goes, I'm safe, I'm good, okay, I can go again. So that is another huge reason to become fat adapted because you don't 
have to be reliant on keeping your blood sugar up all the time and stable. If it drops, that's okay. If you get gut cramps and can't drink anything for two hours or eat anything during an Ironman, it doesn't matter. You won't even notice the difference. Two hours later, if you've got, I mean, ideally when you're keto adapt and you, you, you're doing well and you've, you're fat burning, you've got your nutrition down pat and you don't get gut cramps because you don't need to force this food in to start with. But let's say it does. Let's say you're keto adapted. You've got a gut bug. You don't eat for most of the race. You will actually be fine. It's You're just going to use the fat that you're carrying on your body as fuel and all those other byproducts will recycle and recycle and you'll be great. I've done flat out half Ironmans on no carbohydrates and I haven't run out of glycogen in my muscles or my liver. I have not run out of energy Um as people would like to think. Um, I'm just going to go to a question that I have there. What are your thoughts on heart rate training with different sports? Um, For example, a heart rate of 135 beats per minute running is fairly comfortable, but 135 beats per minute cycling is extremely hard. Yeah, it's a common, common question. Um, I tried to answer this a little bit in a blog that I wrote not too long ago. It's on my website, it's on the Live Your Own Fit website. Um, it's it's on, entitled Math and RPE, so Maximum Aerobic Function and Rate of Perceived Exertion. That's the title. And I basically talk about um, that issue on the bike where people find it really difficult to push hard enough. And my theory, as I wrote about, um, and it's quite long, but go and have a read of that. Um, thanks for your question, Caleb. Um, yep, yeah, go and have a read of that, but I'll try and answer quickly here is my theory is because you, you require such large muscles to push on the bike. Um, it's much more strength-based, whereas running is much more um, uh, the nervous system. It's much more about control. It's much more about the tendons, the ligaments, the, the, the more muscles, the, your, the impact. So you've got all these other um, inputs coming into your body that increase your heart rate quite a lot more than on the bike where you've, you, there's no impact, your weight is, is held, and it's very strength based and the large muscles in your body are asked to do the work. So basically you can't switch on a, my theory is that you can't switch these muscles on enough enough to actually get your heart rate up. So it's very difficult to push really diff, really hard um, because it would be like doing that you know, a thousand times. I mean, my fingers and wrists and everything, they're gonna get really sore quickly even though they're small muscles and they're not really doing much. and I'm, But I'm trying really, really hard. But I would fatigue a lot because I haven't trained my hand to, you know, do this sort of a reaction a thousand times. So when you are on the bike, it takes time to activate your muscles. So the nervous system, I mean, the, the neural pathways for one, So that's by doing some really hard sprints to activate those neural pathways from the brain, the muscles, for everything to light up. You need to build those neural connections. They're just like any other um, communication system in the body. The more you use it, the the more connected they will be, the, the quicker they'll fire, the more of them that will fire, so you'll be able to actually activate more of your muscle. So that's number one. Number two, after you've activated more of your muscle, you then need to train more of your muscle. So you've actually got to work pretty hard to switch on the muscles that you want to switch on, which are going to be the glutes and hamstrings, which generally get really um, uh, um, forgotten about. And you need to train them quite a lot to get them strong. And um, then you build up the capillaries and you build up the mitochondria within them. So until you've got the capillaries that can take the oxygen from your blood until you've got the mitochondria volume increased that they can then produce more energy to activate more of the muscle, then it's really difficult to hold that for a long time. That's why, you know, 10 second sprints to activate the neurons are great because the ATP has built up in your muscles. It's there. You've got, you know, several seconds of ATP ready and waiting to go. You can do those hard efforts and switch on the neural ability. But to try and extend that effort is incredibly difficult when you haven't built up a huge amount of mitochondria and capillaries to then stay fired, to keep producing a large amount of energy um, is quite difficult. So basically, you don't have the 
factories in your muscles to produce energy that makes it demand a lot of oxygen and and the heart to pump a, pump a lot of blood to those muscles. So basically you're using a small amount of your muscles, which was back to my hand sort of thing. You're using a small amount of muscles and that is why it is quite an effort, a perceived effort to get to, to, to work the legs that much um, and to keep them going for a long time. Um, so that's the three steps to getting, um, feeling better. I'm just going to go to my documents here on my laptop and chat a bit more about some of the other factors that I wanted to cover about math and, and aerobic adaptation and how where do we go once we're adapting um i covered the aerobic deficiency syndrome briefly um which was you know it's really interesting when you do see that in somebody um as clear as we have recently with a with a a new client that we've got really interesting um, to see how poor her aerobic capacity is despite being quite a strong athlete. She can push some really good wattage on the bike and yet to ask her to run um, at a 140 heart rate is walking pace because she can't keep her heart rate down. So her sympathetic nervous system is overworked. Her oxidative stress systems are, are overworked. Um, her muscle, her cells and her mitochondria have all been trained to be more anaerobic and they're not fat adapted. They're not aerobic systems. She hasn't got the the oxygen going in through there. So um, really, really fascinating how bad it can be. Um, now, a question from Paul. Thanks, Paul. Do you have high car? Do you have carbs before high intensity training sessions? Um, absolutely not. Um, it makes absolutely zero difference. I sort of mentioned this at the start that it, um, putting fuel into your body does not change the energy at all. Um, putting fuel, a lot of carbohydrates into your system before training is likely to actually make you feel, have a worse session because if you have the carbohydrates before training, you're still going to get an insulin response from spiking your blood sugar. So you eat carbs, blood sugar goes up, insulin comes up to get the blood sugar back down and then that can actually drop your blood sugar a bit past it and you may actually feel a low blood sugar. If you're not fat adapted, you'll feel low blood sugar and not have as good a session. You're also um, increasing the, as I said, uh, most sessions are still aerobic. So except for seven second sprints, which obviously you don't even need any, you don't, that, that's stored ATP. You don't need any fuel to do a seven second sprint. Anything else is aerobic. So to have carbohydrates before any other session, you are going to be increasing the um, amount of glycogen that you're burning instead of the um, aerobic level so like i say you're still using fat and you're still using oxygen even when you're doing a high intensity session um, and what you eat beforehand can influence that to be burning more glycogen than you want it to be burning so james come in with a question james telling me everyone's different with carbs and some people feel better and women feel better with carbohydrates before a high intensity session when certain times of the month. That's what Jamie wanted me to tell you. But everyone's going to be different. But in terms of the general, how the body works in general, having carbohydrates before is not going to give you more energy um, because it just doesn't work like that. Um, energy is only you know a demand-driven um, production. So thanks for the question. Hopefully I did answer it there as I got distracted, but it's all good. Um, so if you cannot run at math, I mean, what do you do if you are walking? If basically 
your math heart rate currently is a walk. Well, that comes back to what Phil's written about many times and probably in, in his the um, thing he just released, the ebook he just put out yesterday is you probably need to lower your math expectations. So it probably is 180 minus your age, minus five or 10. And, and you just need to walk to help build up that aerobic ability for a while. Until you can walk you know, uphill comfortably without your heart rate going above math, you know, that's, that's a big uh, signal that you need to work on your aerobic capacity. Um, not just for performance, not just for endurance, but really, really big one for health to be able to have that oxygen carrying capacity in your cells um, and that fat burning capacity in your body. And there's so many other great benefits as well. Um, so yes, you will just have to walk for a while. Um, and that's what, that's what's happening with um, the client I was talking about. Um, she's just having to back it off. She's, she's good on, she cycles really well. So the cycling though, the intensity has to come down as well because even on the bike, her heart rate spikes really quickly. So the opposite of what um, Caleb mentioned before, um, how it's really hard to get the heart rate up for him. Um, other people will have heart rates that are going up and above their math no matter what uh, because of their lack of aerobic adaptation. So the really interesting um, oxidative stress is, is really interesting. And I've been thinking a lot about this and how it works with um, fat, oxid fat oxidization and how it works with aerobic capacity, how it works with recovery. Um, I think maybe I didn't finish my thought a while ago, probably 20 minutes ago. Uh, you, can, you can kind of figure out if you can increase your math by based on your recovery. So I think I started talking about um, my older client who did the hard effort at the start of the bike. And then, then the, and so basically end of that story is that... Um, with him, we can see that he, he's older, but he's been, you know, low carb for a long time. He's, he's really pretty healthy uh, and he's been training for Ironmans for nonstop for, for, for many, many years, decades. He's been running for decades and decades and decades. Um, so for him, you know, his heart rate, his, his math can go above what it would be because for him, it would be quite low as an older athlete. It'd be like low 120s. So for him though, he can stay really comfortable and aerobic up to 130 comfortably, particularly even running, running, cycling. But we have seen in him, and this is what you, you can do as well, is if he runs and gets his heart rate up to 140, um, then yeah, his recovery is terrible. So we know that the oxidative stress response from him getting up to 140 on a run. So it, it just happens. I didn't prescribe it. It was just, you know, he got a bit carried away a couple of times throughout the months that we've been working together. And, and he just wouldn't maybe watch while he was running. And it would have gotten really hot. Maybe it was off the bike. Um, maybe it was in with a prior coach as well. I saw a couple of examples um, where when his heart rate gets up, his oxidative stress response is huge and we'd seen that we've seen that in the last couple of weeks with his crp test scores um which was super high and so that's been really interesting to actually put a number on the the um inflammation that occurs from exercise and for him we can say okay well we need to keep it under well under 140 heart rate we know that 140 is going to put you in a hole and you're not going to be consistent. You're going to miss a couple of days training at least and potentially more if you then push it and get fatigued, your muscles start to come imbalanced and you could get injured. So really interesting basing your recovery, um, looking at your recovery and then figuring out, okay, what heart rate did I go to yesterday? It might have been a bit too hard for me if I'm still feeling a bit sore today. So if that's the only variable, there's obviously many, many variables throughout everybody's day-to-day -day life. Um, but that's a really interesting thing to keep in mind that if you can stay aerobic, and this is the main point of this whole thing I wanted to do, is if you can stay aerobic, then you can go above 180 minus your age. And the key signals for that would be breathing. I mean, obviously, if you can still breathe through your nose, 
comfortably, then that's a really good signal because your breathing is not getting so um, shallow and that you are then therefore lower oxygen state in your body. You know, the harder you breathe, you'll actually be getting less oxygen into your body because just the way that um, that the physics of it works. So if you're breathing really hard, then you're getting, you know, your body's craving a lot, but it's not using a lot. And you'll therefore be producing more of that stress um, byproducts. You also can measure it obviously off recovery, see how you recovered. Um, you can measure it off perceived effort is a really good one. Like how hard am I going? Like, is it really hard today? I mean, just in the hurt box, is my mind stressed? Um, and the other way is just your body's tension. So a really good way is like, what are your traps doing? Are your traps coming up around your ears? Shoulders coming up around your ears? Well, you're giving your body a signal that you're in fight or flight response, that your your sympathetic nervous system is being triggered, which is likely triggering a response of cortisol and adrenaline. And you know that's going to release some glucose from glycogen into glucose into your bloodstream. And so you probably want to if you are noticing that you're getting tension in your body, neck, um, your breathing, if you're breathing up in the chest and shallow breathing, um, really key signals that you just need to back it off because it's likely that you are producing a higher amount of oxidative stress in your body. And so you want to look at training and you want to look at what you're adapting differently and think of what is the amount of stress that I'm inducing in my body. It's not just what's my heart rate or what's my wattage um, or how long am I running. I, I've been told to do five, five minutes, so I'm going to do five, five minutes. Even if that last minute, you know, I'm tensing my ear, head, shoulders and my ears and I'm breathing really shallow. You've got to throw all the numbers out and listen to your body. Listen to what's happening with oxidative stress. Get in touch. Like even if it's a strength session and you do too many lifts, and you end up with the DOMS, the delayed onset muscle soreness, that is a stress in your body as well that your body's then got to recover from. So it's not just about numbers. Feel what is going on in your body, and that is going to be your best cue for am I staying in a low-stressed state to get the best adaptation possible? So obviously, there are times when you want to stress your body. And you can certainly stress your body out by doing math heart rate. By, by like I say, it's, it's math heart rate. It is, it is maximum aerobic function. It is not 180 minus your age. That is a guide in you know brackets after the math bit. But the math bit, maximum aerobic function, is a moving object. It's a moving target. For some people when they're sick, even day to day, if you wake up and you're not well, you are going to use less oxygen for energy. So you're going to be producing more of that oxidative stress, more free radicals. So if you go out and train when your breathing is really labored, you, you're coming down with some bug, then the accumulative stress that I mentioned earlier, that compounding stress is going to be huge compared to the same session when you're healthy. So day to day, Consider the oxidative stress that you're placing in your body, um, the accumulative stress that you are placing on your body. And that is how you can determine your maximum aerobic function. Um, got to thank Phil Maffetone again for the guidance that he'd given me years ago and for the great articles that he still puts out. The ebook that he put out um, just yesterday, um, really looking forward to finishing my way through that. Um, I'd love you all to go and read some of that article that I'd written about math and rate of perceived exertion um, on my website or the Live Your Own Fit website. And, and while you're at the Live Your Own Fit website, check out some of our packages that we've got for helping to coach people with sports performance. But also, you know, we've got a great 12-week program, which is more encompassing the holistic um, approach to health. So obviously, sleep breathing, mindset, exercise, um, and emotional stress, and the nervous system, um, and all of that sort of stuff. We've worked with a wide range of people, and it's really interesting working with all of these different sorts of people from 
really great athletes um, that I'm coaching currently um, with training plans and right through to clients that Jamie's had and we put out a podcast just today um, that was around um, more around mindset, emotional health and well-being and then how that helped her change her outcomes of what she was eating, how she felt about herself, um, her lifestyle um, and just how she feels about herself. So that's really interesting as well if you're interested in the lifestyle changes that we can help you with that podcast came out today. Um, all our other podcasts are going to be out. I'll try and put this onto a podcast if I can figure out how to do that. Um, and I think that's about it for everyone out there. Thanks very much for joining in and know that you can keep getting faster and you can keep staying aerobic. Just be aware of the adaption that you are placing into your body. So if you keep putting in that, uh, those inputs of high oxygen state, um, low carbohydrate state or high fat burning states, then you can really push the limits of where you're going. Um, you know, Mark Allen did it. And you can be sure that he wasn't racing at 180 minus his age, but he was still so aerobically efficient that at a higher heart rate, he was still, he was still in his math. He was still at maximum aerobic function for the whole race. Um, and you don't have to be, I mean, uh, the... The caveat here, I'm talking to age groupers because professional athletes, they'll all like poo-poo a bit of the low-carb stuff, but they're training so many hours a week and they live this day-to-day. Their recovery, they can recover because of all the other pr- processes they've got and naps and no stress and no work and all of that stuff. But they still become very aerobically adapted um, even though they're eating a higher carb diet because of the hours that they're training and the recovery that they can get in and they can back up and train. It's a totally different story to everybody else who is wanting health, fitness and performance out of themselves as well as being able to still go to work, still spend time with the family, still feel good day to day. I mean, that is what improving your maximum aerobic function and becoming fat adapted is aiming to achieve and can achieve quite easily. Um, So yeah, thanks very much for joining in. I hope you've got some more questions after listening to this um, and I'll get back to future questions in another episode. All right, thanks very much, guys. It's been really good chatting for 55 minutes. All right, have a good night. See you guys. Bye.